Success is what uh, every executive team is thinking of when they decide to invest on machine learning. And success is hard and complex. And in ML is no exception. You have multiple dimensions of success. One may think immediately on impact. How ML is impacting your company bottom line. But there's more to that. If you think about success to your team, you think about sustainability. How long you are able to retain a team member in average. How many incidents your product has. Or you can think also in scalability. How hard will it be for you to scale your product to a larger customer base, to a different size of the company? This is also success. And there are all other dimensions, right? So today, I'm here to talk about what I would like to have known when I firstly became a manager of a machine learning team roughly eight years ago. Um, I'm about to share the lessons that I learned okay, with you, thinking that you have to take it at a grain of salt because all these things may be applicable or not to your organization, depending on the industry you are working on, the maturity of your data infrastructure, the maturity of your executive team, and so on and so forth. It is absolutely paramount that you see success as something multidimensional. And throughout this talk, this is something that um, you understand very well. Today, also here with me uh, is also Nuno, uh, Nuno Martins, that is one of the individual contributors of, of one of the ML teams uh, that I have uh, on our organization. And some of these things, of course, you can always ask me which is my opinion of uh, some of these things, and I'll get a biased opinion as the manager, or in this case, the director. Uh, but you can always like post questions as directly to him here and outside on the coffee chats on how some of these things work from a perspective that somebody that is uh, working on this uh, on a daily basis from a perspective of an individual contributor. Going straight to the talk today, start with the preface about ML product lifecycle. And one thing that I noticed uh, here on this conference, but also on other, uh, other uh, venues uh, across the globe, is many times we talk about data science. Data science is not but a series of practices that we use to take care of model development, right? And model development is only one of the three stages, okay, or three dimensions, if you want, that comprise ML product lifecycle. So the other two are operations, or basically infrastructure, or uh, engineering, if you want, or uh, that is necessary to operate that model, serve that model towards your customers as a product. But we also have design stage, which is often uh, underrated and very, very important. That's where you gather requirements. You make sure that you are answering the right question. You are able to translate the business question into an ML question that can be solved with a computer and with data. And also like how available data, data is and how success looks like. And believe me, to build success for ML products, you will need to address questions on all of these three dimensions. And throughout the presentation, I'll be looping back to these three dimensions to highlight the importance that a holistic perspective uh, over success will have to you on managing your teams. Starting now with the first learning ways of working. Um, tell me something, I have a question for the audience. Among you, so who has or ever had a superhero working on their teams? What is fantastic for me is I see so many hands up. I didn't say what a superhero is on ML teams, but everybody knows, right? 
is that guy that, when there is an incident, is the first to step in on the code and fix it immediately. When you have a problem, he comes up with a solution, or she comes up with a solution, and it's solved. Always have the right answer. Answers it immediately. Always moves, does the most uh, amount of output. And you'll say, okay, this is the person is very valuable to the team. I would like to challenge that idea. It's impopular. It's an impopular statement that I want to make. Yes, there's a person probably from um, expertise point of view brings a lot to your team, but not working as superhero. So you will be much more successful if you are able to build super teams. If you are able not to assign projects as individuals, but to teams working collaboratively to address that problem, that project. And that would include this person sometimes take a step back, let other solution or other idea to win, even if that idea he disagrees with it, or is probably the wrong idea to go forward, because that creates a healthy space for failure and then for growth. And growth is what many professionals on ML, but not only, but in ML, it is very important, are seeking for their careers. And growing or not growing may be the reason why they will stay on your company or they will move on. Okay? So one foot for thought. Second is pair programming at default. Again, in management teams, there is sometimes the, the controversy of thinking that pair programming is one person coding and another watching. Okay. And that couldn't be more far from truth. Yeah? So many times what we observe on teams is when challenges on ML, typically complex, both on, uh, on in any of the stages that I've talked with you before, uh, is tackled collaboratively, it's actually done faster. And in the end of the day, once the team is oiled up, the team is able to add more value working on a full collaborative fashion than on having one task per person, the classical way of doing so. It's like the saying, two heads think better than one. It's literally, it's literally true. Second, how to prioritize things to your team. ML teams are probably the teams that aim to solve the most complex problems that you have in the company. But make no mistake, ML teams are also there to do profit, like everyone else. So impact must be something beyond discussion, must be crystal clear what is the impact that that team is expected to do on bottom line. And the rules of the game also must be clear. Which are the metrics that we expect to move? For instance, by the end of the quarter. And OKRs, here it comes merely as a suggestion, is a great framework to define this in a quantitative fashion. So as planning, we plan with OKRs. We say we want you to improve the recommendation engine to increase conversion by 10%. Punct. That's it. And then how to do it? It's up to the teams. Okay. Solution space? Up to the teams. But it's crystal clear we talk about impact. We talk about in terms for planning that are crystal clear for everybody uh, uh, in the company and are quantitative and beyond discussion. Uh, and we may fail, okay, because we depend on other teams. And th that will always be true, no matter how small your company is, if it is like just a few team members, you depend on each other. But after a, a, a scale of 50 or more, it will always be true that in order to succeed, you depend on other teams. So don't be afraid of owning key results that you cannot control. This is actually how this framework is supposed to be used in the first place. And then the second idea, which is, may also be controversial, is that if you are in production, you are doing ML engineering. So and here, it's this statement. It's about there is if you are thinking of putting something in production, that something will always be an engineering service. It will be a backend microservice, it will be backend something, and that something will need to communicate with others who need to scale, 
will have a data lineage and so on. So I truly believe that it's not enough, okay? If you are not a company like Facebook, Apple, Netflix, uh, Amazon, or Google, probably you will have at max a machine learning engineering team that will own services end to end, okay? So will all the team members be end to end? Probably not. That will be the dream. That is hard to find somebody that is good on all single stages of that. But the team must be, okay? And the team must own the service end to end. So this is like also uh, something that will really create clarity, will really reduce the F and them, which is very strong among data professionals, unfortunately, still today. Um, and will create a clear ownership, a clear space where teams will know, okay, the service has a problem, it's everybody's problem. Regardless if I'm, my background is more infrastructure, data engineering, or, or, or data science. Third, professionalization. Focus on what matters. One thing that I see a lot, not only on ML space, but especially on ML space, is a manager that is expected to do everything. He manages roadmaps. He creates the vision. He prioritizes the backlog. She is the technical lead of the team. She creates the team and makes the gatherings to, to, and one-on-ones to build trust and build connections. Also solves the architecture. Also solves the hardest problem of the team. Damn. I'm tired just to say how many things the manager needs to solve to, to, be, to be a good manager. And that's tiring. And that makes people quit. Now, if, as is the other manager. Okay? It's not sustainable. And if they don't quit, they end up paying less attention to some of these topics systematically, and that would then will produce uh, causes down the stream that make teams fail or be less successful than they could be. So don't be afraid of professionalizing and having like investing like on a manager that is more focused on technically the team and build trust and build a good team, and then having technical product owners or technical product managers, depending on the culture of your company then, and the frameworks you use, can use different names, to be persons that are actually making this stakeholder management, making this, this roadmap, even managing backlog uh, for you, and let the individual contributors own the solution space fully, including the architecture. Let them make decisions and fail. Because only that, they will feel the heat and they will feel the ownership that we are driving this. And they put the t-shirt on. We, we are driving this. We are the owners. And if we do a mistake, nobody will come to save us. So we all need to roam together. Yeah? This is very, very important. Create a sustainable environment where the manager has a role, product has a role, and then the ICs also have their role very well. So we don't need to extravasate and go having the ICs thinking how we'll get budget and having the managed thinking being a slide set maker and having the product come and say, well, I don't know anything about AI ML, so this is not with me. This is with the data guys, right? So it is another idea that I saw being uh, many times the reason of failure and other times uh, being the reason of success or one of the factors. Then hiding, which is something that Stefan also touched on his presentation before. Um, about hiding, it's very important to you to understand So there is no perfect hire, okay? So you need to pick your battles. Typically, when you are choosing, okay, you'll be choosing which are the limitations, which are the drawbacks that this person will bring that you think that your team will be able to live with or that you think that we will be able to grow this person on that on that skill set because the environment we have a team because of the technologies that we are um, using I believe that this person will grow so what i found a trade off that i found useful to have talent first so keep technical hiring bar high compromise on other things such as location have the teams distributed have the teams work remote nowadays that's, that's uh, flexibility also means being working remote. So have a larger talent pool. So you have a larger inflow you can choose from. And then have a high technical bar and have slots that are very signal focused. 
So forget the idea of the panels. Oh, to hire a person, we have to have this and this and this, this person to interview. No, have other slots focused. Behavioral interview, ML system design, live coding. So you know on that slot, that is the signal that you are expecting to get from this person. And this will be good for you because you'll make sure that you have the signals that you need to decide. But who also will be good for candidate experience, that they know what to expect from each uh, interview slot. I don't arrive there, have a person that can ask everything. And then if you go, oh, what you are asking me, he already asked two free, uh, <laughs> two free slots before. And finally, organize team events. Okay, Face-to-face -face workshops that allow people to connect with each other, to build trust, to know beyond uh, 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 the screen and the, the, the image of that person. And then some of you may say, oh, Louis, but that is very expensive. Well, the average cost for a MIS hire in Europe is between 30 to 50K. So I'll let you do the maths. What is more expensive is to, uh, to organize quarterly team events like we do or to do one or two MIS hires a year. Finally, last two, how to approach green leaves ML projects. Well, all of you already had the CEO, the exec team, the product team come to you and say, hey, we have here this use case, Louis, that really need the ML team, you know, in three months. Build something, okay, to address. So this is like the classic, okay, another use case for the ML team to, to solve. And here, uh, the message that I want to, to pass is first, this is a very ambiguous problem. Okay, we use typically a framework where we divide this problem into five sub-problems that typically work for everything. One is problem statement, which is to, to define, okay, this is a business problem, how this translates to ML problem, and how success looks like. Is it conversion? Is it revenue? Is it gross profit? So methodology, this is what you would say it is everything around modeling. Which data we'll use, which features we'll use, which algorithm we'll use to train, which loss function we'll use. Then offline evaluation, evaluation protocol, cross validation, sometimes you require validation, all doubt, et cetera. Evaluation metrics and how that evaluation metrics are proxies, how good proxies are for the original target, um, target uh, metric. And don't care about perfection. It is about time to market. Make sure that you are able to build an MVP that will enable you to learn and iterate. Okay? Only the customer, only the consumer will be able to validate your solution. So care of building something as fast as you can that makes sense that you can see did that, did that value or not. Okay? And then you have the two components, classic architecture and live evaluation. That's uh, how you will serve the model and how we'll evaluate on CD in the real world if it is moving the needle or not. Finally, MLOps. I believe that everybody uh, uh, has already the common sense uh, here on the audience that it's key for successful projects to have a bo uh, good architecture. Here, what I want to give a step forward to, on this message is that it's also good to have great hires and great teams, okay? One thing that is important is, again, MLOps architecture is part of the team solution space. So the team has to own these decisions, okay? The team has to do discovery collaboratively, okay? And then we have, for instance, a prioritization framework such as the Moscow, one that where you are able to put forward requirements that you have for the software, and in this way, constrain the choices without invading the solution space for them. Okay, and that is a very important point because this will make the team more engaged to a solution that they chose than a solution that you impose to them. And protect that solution space is absolutely key to have uh, uh, teams uh, reliable and engaged to you. Then compare the these softwares one on one but finally do a poc of them end to end this is absolutely absolutely key to set an architecture that is harmonious and is not this is the best for orchestration this is the best for monitoring and so on and so forth and you'll see if you have a better 
a more state-of-art MLOps infra, this will attract people to your company that want to work on such company, okay? Just for the fact that you have a good infra, because they know they'll have a dev, better dev experience, because they will know that they will learn and grow. Right? Key takeaways of my uh, 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 presentation, build super teams, not superheroes. Let the team build it and run it so and they will find better ownership. EM is a full-time job, so is individual contributor. Prioritize problems and outcomes, not solutions. Hire good people, no matter where they are. Start simple and go live as soon as possible with new projects. And the road for a perfect MLOps uh, infrastructure is long. But you can enjoy the road and you can reap the benefits on betting of that long-term vision by keeping the people engaged and gain more opportunities to learn and grow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luis. It was amazing, quite comprehensive, touching all aspects of, of managing this team, so congratulations. We have a few questions, and I will go directly to your questions at this time. So the first question is around pair programming, and there could be a perception that it is more expensive, and how do you go about explaining why there is a positive return on investment? Um, so we actually did that by experimentation, okay. right? So it was very clear that we had sprints where the team was not doing fully pair programming or percentage-wise, they were doing low amount of pair programming. And then we had iterations where the team was doing a large amount of pair programming. And for the management, we'll show, oh, there is much more output delivered when uh, there is pair programming than not. Of course, that the real measure would be value, of course, but for management output, Worked just fine to it's get a good that message proxy. across. <laughs> um, so show the value, right? I think that ultimately it's all about showing the value. It makes perfect sense. The second one, and we have a lot of interest around OKRs. And the first one is how do you communicate OKR execution? how well you are doing to non-technical audiences. So how do you explain the progress you are doing towards the OKRs and how do you manage that communication? Okay, so so typically, so our teams, I didn't use much the word agile to not fall on a common place, but our teams are very agile and we very agile processes. So we do have uh, sprint reviews uh, where externals are invited to come and where we look to OKRs every two weeks. Okay. However, uh, these KRs are updated on a weekly basis, so they can go there. But I think that that communication starts on the definition. Like I said, the key results must be set as well on lag metrics that are things that everybody in the company understands. If the metric is already something that is transparent, then you just need to show how the needle is moving there and everybody understands. Okay. As a continuation, a follow-up question. Uh, for the quarterly planning meetings, for all these meetings, is the entire team invited uh, for, for planning the OKRs or, or not? No, no. You answer. Initially, the first, the, the first drafts of the OKRs are uh, the by management team, but then only as a discussion with you to uh, agree on uh, what the best values are if anyone wants to write. Thank you, Nunu. So for everyone, and if I understand correctly, there is a first proposal that is top-down, but every single thing is discussed with the entire team. Correct. And the, do they have power then to propose changes? Yes. OK, OK. So top-down, but then bottom-up feedback and, and proposals. Back propagation, exactly. <laughs> um, and finally, um, we have. We are a little bit late, but I think this is important. OKRs, sometimes the team may become a little bit metric-driven, a little bit OKR-driven. How do you prevent that from stifling innovation, disruptive thinking and going beyond or trying out different things that may not immediately relate to the metrics? 
I don't yet. Okay. I don't yet. So I think we are still on the stage that it's important to build trust from the management and be able to deliver on what we promise, which is something that fortunately this year uh, teams have been, have been good at. Um, but right now, we are slow on that. So if it's not on the OKRs, okay, basically, focus. does not exist. Does not exist. It's yeah. focus time. Yes, absolutely. Makes perfect sense.